All right, welcome into Sports Bit. Betting insight today. Wake up with Paulie and Teddy. It's Thursday, March 3rd. Big game, big game breakdown, play of the day, deep dive, all that coming up. We start with the hardcore four. We'll go rapid fire for four minutes. And of course, we'll get to bad beats and wrong sides. Teddy, the Spurs win again. 29 and 0 at home. They're 51 and 9 on the season. And they have made the playoffs 19 straight years. Incredible. Yeah, they beat us. You know, I, us. I mean, we were looking at uh, we were debating between the Pistons and the over last night. We went with the over. Uh, it didn't matter which one of those two sides uh, we had, unfortunately, for the play of the day, a play of the day loser, uh, which you don't like very much. But I mean, 19 consecutive playoff appearances. And you're talking about a team that has nine losses on the season. That's won every home game. And they're not even the best team in the NBA right yeah, now. They're four uh, games that's the incredible up. thing about what the Spurs are doing. And it's mm -hmm. so typical of what we've seen from San Antonio throughout this you know, era. Is that, yeah, other teams get the highlights. Other teams have the highlight reel shots. Other teams get all the pub. Just like the Warriors are getting. But the Spurs just doing what they do. And winning games and covering point spreads. And I know what you're thinking. March 19th, Golden State goes to San Antonio. We're talking about this in March not one but two teams could run the table at home for an entire season. Uh, pat yourself on the back. The Celtics thump the Blazers. You love this Boston team, and you love Brad Stevens. 12 straight home wins for the Celtics. Yeah, I, I mean, look, Boston's a team we've talked about a lot on this show. I recommended a play uh, on the Celtics to win the East in one of our first uh, sports bits that we shot, Paul. And, you know, I mean, Portland's not a second-tier team. It wasn't a great spot necessarily for the Blazers. They'd won their first three uh, on this road trip. But the fact that Boston just put a beat down on them, you know, like they've been doing on a pretty consistent basis. Celtics, you love teams like Boston. The chemistry is there. Everybody likes each other. They don't have the superstars. Those are the type of teams that tend to retain their point spread value, Paul, just like the Celtics have done. You like this team as well, to college basketball. Miami with a huge road win at Notre Dame. You got to love Laranaga. Takes George Mason to the Final Four. Before we got to Miami, zero. Zero times they won a conference title. Now, he goes to Miami. If they beat Virginia Tech on Saturday, it'll be the second time in four years, and they're doing it in the big, bad ACC. Yeah, and look, I mean, this is a program with no history of success. It's not like Miami had this basketball-rich tradition or, or anything even comparable. I mean, they were afterthoughts in the old Big East. Laranega takes over, and you mentioned the run that he had with George Mason. That's how his name got on people's radar screens. But the bottom line is this is a coach who has been a program builder. He's done it here in Miami. And though I'll, I'll say this much, Virginia Tech all of a sudden has won four in a row. Uh, yeah, that win me. for Miami may not be as easy as some might think. Hell of a performance out of Marcus Posley as well. A game that St. Bonaventure had to have there on the bubble. He had 47 points, most for a D1 player this year. 15-19 from the floor. They're now 21-7 as the Bonnies beat St. Joe 98-90. What a performance out of that young man. And you want to know what $305,000 looks like? There's the ticket. We talked about it earlier in the week. A guy hit a 15 out of 15 parlay card at William Hill. The progressive jackpot. $305,000, and he needed Kansas on Monday night to cash the ticket. Rocking chair game. First score, 15 to nothing. Yeah, they did, I mean, you know, wire to wire job, but let's give him credit. You know, this is what $305,375 looks like. I've never hit a score like that in my betting career, Paul. I'm pretty sure you haven't either. No, that's right. Well done. Congratulations to that, man. It's our first sports bet brick alert. Brick alert! The Houston Rockets. Three of 34 from three, that's a record. Minimum 30 attempts from three. The Rockets couldn't make anything, but they won the game 100 to 95. Teddy, what does that say about the Pelicans? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, here's to New Orleans. And New Orleans has been bad all year. Let's make no mistake about it. This has been an underachieving team from day one. But when your opponent shoots three of 34 and puts up a brick fest like you're seeing right now, you're supposed to win the game. You know, uh, I mean, the Pelicans at least covered the number, barely. But the fact that their opponent shoots three for 34, sheesh, this is not a good sign for New Orleans moving forward. Though I haven't seen many good signs for New Orleans moving forward. It's been a bad team all year, Paul. 
Yeah. All right. Time for bad beats. What the hell happened to Rutgers? Oh my God. Rutgers, you know, I'm mean, here. Sparty laying 25 on the road. All right. Rutgers trails by two at halftime. And sometimes that's your worst case scenario when you got a live dog, when, when you got a dog plus a whole bunch of points, because then the opponent goes into halftime and they're like, we stunk in the first half. Let's, let's uh, pick it up a notch. That's absolutely what uh, what Michigan State did in the second half. Sparty, 54 to 25 after the break. Minus 25? No problem. And how about Brian Forbes, or Bryn Forbes, I should say. Big Ten record, 11 three-pointers in that ballgame. One guy covered the minus 25, Polly, all by himself. Incredible. And, 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 hey, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, coffees for closers. OKC <laughs> cannot close. Up 17 in the fourth quarter last night against the Clippers. They lose the game. Yeah, and that's, you know, I mean, we've talked about it with Oklahoma City a lot. We're going to talk about it in big game breakdown when we talk about the Thunders matchup with the Warriors tonight. But a uh, great uh, quote from Glenn Gary again, Ross. Yeah, sure. Coffee is for closers. OKC has not gotten the job done in that regard. Not just last night, but repeatedly. Both previous meetings against the Warriors, for example. Again, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more later. One thing I forgot to mention, Paul, and I have to mention it here when we talk about Michigan State. You know, you're taking the plus 25 with Rutgers. Uh, how about Sparty now? 10-0 and against the spread. Their last 10. You don't see a lot of runs from top-notch teams like that at this stage of the campaign. But it also says that your money to be made with Michigan State has probably already come and gone. Teams like the Spartans are going to be a little bit difficult to uh, find accurate or reasonable point spread value with in the month of March, in the month of March, as they go into the Big Ten tournament and then the Big Dance. Wrong sides. Heavy steam on the over with the Bulls and the Magic. Never had a chance. No, steamed up from 209 to 216. Game falls 191. Never played at the pace. Uh, that the betting market is expected, and certainly when it comes to offensive efficiency. I mean, you know, Chicago's hit or miss in that regard right now. Not a good effort from the Bulls again uh, last night, but if you had that over, if you were one of those who were steaming it up, you know, when you fell 25 points short off the closer. And here's a, here's a doozy. The America <laughs> East. Oh, Albany, the two seed at home, laying 18 and a half against Hartford. They beat them by 26 and 16. They lost. They lost the game. Hartford came into the game 9 and 22 on the season. They win and move on. Albany, they collect the jersey season over. Survive in advance. You know, <laughs> uh, minus 18 and a half loses the game in straight up fashion. Remember, you know, the second win, you know, you talked about the two meetings earlier 86 60, 75 59. The second win came on Saturday. So you wonder if they're like, oh, we can beat this team. Uh, the Great Danes just came out flat as a pancake. But look, uh, I mean, we're getting right into the heart of conference tournament season, oh, Pauly. You know, Ohio Valley, America East, Northeast Conference, all in action already. And of course, you know, for me at least, when it comes to the likes of the America East and the Northeast Conference, you know, I'm not trying to suddenly get a read on the Maryland-Baltimore City Retrievers. You know, <laughs> uh, because if, 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 if there aren't teams that I've followed all year, I'm really not dying to suddenly say, all right, well, I've got a good read. Oh, I can tell. And I'm telling a lot of guys that I've seen try to pick off these smaller conferences in conference tournament play and pick off some winners. I'm telling you, sometimes the best thing to do is just leave it alone. Uh, and certainly with the America East, with the Northeast Conference, with the Patriot League starts tomorrow, the Big South starts tomorrow, the Atlantic Sun uh, starts today. Uh, the Metro Atlantic Conference starts today. The Missouri Valley Conference that starts today. Some of these where, again, you've had lines all year. Missouri Valley, obviously. Metro Atlantic, uh, you've had lines all year. Teams that you follow, yeah, I'm definitely willing uh, and looking forward to getting involved with some of these games. But the teams that haven't been lined all year, that I haven't been following all year, I'm sure as hell not going to try to put uh, you know uh, bets down on teams that I just don't know a whole lot about. Coming up next, big game breakdown. Of course, we'll hit on the Thunder and the Warriors, and you won't believe the game we start with on Sportsbit. Betting Insight today. Back on Sportsbit, Betting Insight today. Wake up with Pauly and Teddy. Time for the big game breakdown, and you won't... <laughs> it's hard to say with a straight face. We're starting with the Suns and the Heat. Miami laying 14. Why are we starting with the Suns? How does a guy handicap and power rate Phoenix? 
They were down 43 against Charlotte, and the starters were out for Charlotte as well. Now, don't forget, Hornacek was fired. They also whacked the assistants. So does Earl Watson really know what he's doing? He certainly doesn't have a, any experience here, Teddy. What do we do with this team? Uh, and um, whatever power rating number you have for Phoenix is probably too high. You know, uh, I've had them below the 76ers for the better part of the last two months. Now I think I've got them at least three or I think three points below Philadelphia. Uh, and of course, this is something that I update on a daily basis. So it's always, you know, moving up a half point, moving down a half point. But uh, I mean, I, and you talk about the coaching change again, it wasn't just Hornacek, but Jerry Sickdean got fired. Mike Longabardi got fired. Those are the two guys who have been with Hornacek and who've been coached up those guys. I've always, I was always an Earl Watson fan as a player. You know, I loved his heart. I really thought that, you know, he wasn't a great player, but he made the most of his abilities. But boy, you know, the X's and O's aren't going right for Phoenix right now. The attitude's not going right for Phoenix right now. But, uh, and you, you know, we talked about it on yesterday's show, Paul. We're talking about a team that's now lost 11 straight road games by double-digit margins. But, you know, meanwhile, a change in uniforms just did wonders for Joe Johnson, didn't it? It sure did, and he was a ball stopper in Brooklyn, but now he comes to Miami, and, and you know, they like to kind of slow it down with pace, and he's been sensational what he's doing so far with the Heat. He certainly had. 24 points on 10 of 13 shooting against the Knicks. Uh, you know, he's not a great fit in a lot of places in this lineup, but, of course, in Brooklyn, he was forced to take a lot of shots as they deferred to him with the shot clock winding down, his percentage are going to be low. That's not going to be the case in Miami. And, of course, Miami dumps the ball off to him with three seconds on the shot clock. Joe Johnson can hit a big shot, no question. But before you run to the betting window to lay 14 points to the Miami Heat, it's worth noting two factors. Number one, Miami is coming off the single best shooting game for any team in the NBA this season. They shot 52 of 77. 67.5% against the Bulls. And it's hard, obviously, to come up with shooting efforts like that two games in a row. It's also worth noting that Miami, for this season, has a grand total of one point spread cover when laying minus seven or higher. They're one and six ATS laying big points. All right, to the big game, OKC and Golden State. No line on this. Curry and Iguodala questionable again. Look at this graph. In the first two meetings... In the first 45 minutes, OKC was plus 7. Three minutes left to the end of the game, Golden State plus 18. With three minutes left in the two games, OKC was tied on the road and up 7 at home. Golden State won the end game by 8 and at home and won by 10 on the road. 116-108 to 108 and 121-118 to 118 in overtime on Saturday night. Now, off the debacle last night in L.A., what am I going to get out of OKC tonight? Confidence? based on what's happened in the first two meetings? Or is this a, a team maybe kind of uh, hurting for confidence and shaking at this point? Yeah, let, let's talk about some potential numbers here. Obviously, we've got a game with no early line based on the questions. Iguodala's now been downgraded to doubtful. I don't think he's going to suit up. But Curry is very questionable. Uh, the Glantz-Culver line. I got some uh, numbers from uh, Keith Glantz. Uh, it says that Golden State, 8.5, 232 with Curry and Iguodala in. That would drop to two and a half slash two twenty four with that duo out. So that's just a guesstimate about where this number is going to come. And again, you know the Thunder last night they're up ninety three to seventy seven at the what seven and a half minutes left in that game, end up losing, failing to cover. They're tied with three minutes uh, to go in the first meeting against uh, Golden State. Lose that, end up losing that game by eight. They're up seven uh, with three minutes to go in the second meeting, end up losing that game in overtime. Now look, you know, Oklahoma City does some things extraordinarily well. They have two of, I don't know, what do you want to call Durant and Westbrook? Top five players in the game? Absolutely, absolutely. You know? Yeah. And look at this graphic when it comes to the NBA's best rebounding teams over the last 10 years. This is a percentage of available rebounds that a team gets. You've got the Bulls, uh, you know, and their Thibodeau, and when they were really, you know, low post muscle every night. You had a Blazers team and a Jazz team and a Lakers team from what back in the day. How about this? Oklahoma City this year getting more than 54% of all available rebounds. That's the best in the last 10 years. So the Thunder out rebounded Golden State 112 to 78 in those first two meetings 
lost them both in straight up fashion. But even with their end game struggles, when you're getting rebounds at this type of rate, you're getting more possessions than your opponent. Gives you a chance to hang around for a long, long time. Excellent numbers there. We wrap it up with college basketball. A huge game tonight. Cal at Arizona. Arizona lay in six. Cal 7-0 and straight up in ATS in the month of February. They are now ranked. And hey, Tennessee fans, where are you at? You, you ran Martin out of town, essentially. He was sick and tired of it. He even had a deep tournament run. But now be careful what you wish for because you're stuck with Rick Barnes and you're lousy. And this guy's doing a hell of a job at Cal. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that Rick Barnes found another job. Huh. <laughs> well, I mean, you think about how much talent he had at Texas oh, and how little he won at Texas during all that span. Yeah. You know? Uh, but, uh, I mean, the, the the state of the Tennessee athletic programs are a little bit dicey right now. You know? <laughs> yeah, Everybody's you under that. fire uh, in volunteer country these days. Uh, but, you know, Cal, I mean, this squad is red hot. You know, you talked about a 7-0 straight up. 7-0 against the spreads in the beginning of February. And you've got two freshmen in terms of Rab uh, and uh, Jalen Brown. Ivan Rab and Jalen Brown, both now projected to be lottery picks, you know, uh, you, uh, Cal's really big in size. You know, you have Kingsley, uh, Okora, and then Rab, uh, two seven-footers manning the paint. What does that mean? Number 14 in the country in defensive efficiency. Nobody's getting any shots by the rim against Cal. They're number three in the nation at defending two-point shots. Um, and depending on, I, I haven't looked at the stats uh, after Sparty's uh, win last night, but that may in fact be number two uh, as opposed to number three. That half-court defense has been stellar. Meanwhile, you know, uh, I talked about Jalen Brown and Ivan Rand predicting to be lottery picks. Zona doesn't have any first-rounders this year. You know, Ryan Anderson's draft stock has dropped like a rock. You know, and we're talking about, of course, Sean Miller having lost six underclassmen to the NBA draft over the last three years. But you got to ask yourself, Paul, Arizona, are they going to be in a feisty mood after getting swept on that Colorado-Utah trip? And, of course, they also have revenge for a 74-73 loss at Cal early in the season. And I'm sure they're sick and tired because they're on when they get beat, I think it's 11 of the last 12 court stormings have happened in Arizona games. So they're <laughs> sick and tired. It's one thing to go on the road and get beat. Every time you lose, they're storming the court on you, and it adds insult to injury. And then Miller went off at the court storming when they lost to Colorado saying, our players, gonna, we're going to punch someone in the face. You want that, huh? So that's, yeah, they're going to be in a pissed-off mood and more on this game coming up. Up next, we'll get to the deep dive in the topic of the day. Do not bet on spring training in baseball. We'll get to that in the play of the day on Sportsbit. Betting Insight today. Final go around here on Sportsbit. Betting Insight today. Play of the day coming up. The topic of the day, the deep dive. Do not bet spring training. Stay away. Avoid it. Well, I was a Cubs fan. I remember one year in the 80s, they were killing it, scoring a lot of runs, blowing people out. Of course, last place finish. Teddy, why should we stay away at all costs uh, with spring training? Well, it's not a stay away at all costs. It's a question of, is something handicappable? And if it is, do you have a legitimate edge? When it comes to betting spring training games, I have never found anything that gives me a legitimate edge. And of course, the markets tend to react on days where a bunch of regulars are sitting or a bunch of regulars are going to play or a pitcher is supposed to get a couple of, you know, an extra inning or two worth of work. And the markets tend to react to that. The teams that have their starters in are going to get money. The teams that are, have all the young guys in are, are generally not going to get money. But think about it. You know, you talk about uh, when me and you were talking off air, you're like, yeah, Maddox they used to always experiment with different pitches. All the veterans do. They're not worried about winning a spring training game. They're not worried about hitting a home run. They're not worried about it. They're worried about getting the kinks out of their swing. They're worried about making sure that they are prepped for opening day. It's a completely different scenario than what we're talking about in preseason NFL. Preseason NFL is a moneymaker and a legitimate moneymaker. Preseason baseball, exhibition baseball, it's really hard. I, I I haven't found an edge. Have you? No, never. And I don't. You, excellent point about Maddox. So even when you say, I know a, a professional better who's who does very well in baseball every year. Maybe one or two spring training games a year, and that's it. But how do you think you have an edge when you see an example like Maddox, who would get rocked every spring and was trying to work on new pitches, and you say most guys do that? I've never found an edge. Now, to compare it to the NFL preseason, there is dynamite information out there. I make money every year in the NFL preseason 
because some guys want to go balls out and win the game, or you have battles, and you're going to say, hey, I mean, it's, it's valuable information to say the second string quarterback is going to take all the snaps in the second half while you're going up against the third or fourth string or some guy who's bagging groceries next week or the other team. <laughs> yeah, and that's another issue, of course, because in the NFL, you've got guys who are legitimately going to be bagging groceries next week, and that doesn't happen in baseball. In baseball, you don't make the big league roster, big deal. You're going to go down and spend, you know, go down to triple A or go down to double A. You're not off the team and starting from scratch again. You know, maybe you find a practice squad that you can hang out with in the NFL. But by and large, players are playing for their careers. And I saw a number just today, uh, Paul, talking about how the average length of an NFL career just keeps getting shorter and shorter and shorter. It's just over two years right now for the average guy in the NFL. So, and that's not the case. For baseball, it's not, I mean, it's not like everyone that gets to the show lasts for 10 or 15 or 20 years. It doesn't happen. But when you're talking about quantifiable edges, when you're saying, all right, this lineup is going to be good and this lineup's not going to be good. Here's a, a matchup edge that you can find. You find that stuff all the time in NFL preseason. You made up a great point. You know, here's the second string quarterback. He's going to be going up against third and fourth string defenders. He's a veteran. The coach wants to throw the ball a little bit. These are great positive expectation situations. You find them every year in the NFL preseason. When it comes to Major League Baseball, where you have, what, 30 games, you know, uh, between now and opening day, and none of them really matter all that much. And, you know, one day you may have the starters that are going to play a whole bunch, but they're just, you know, working out the kinks in their swing or relaxing and having fun. Uh, again, not guys who are stressed about making the team. In NFL preseason, the guys who aren't stressed about making the team, they're out by the second quarter. You know, uh, that's not the case uh, in, in MLB. So if there's no edge, there's no wager. I haven't found an edge for betting preseason. If you've got one, let us know. We'll leave a comment. Uh, and we will be very interested in seeing it and talking about it on the show down the line. All right, let's get back on track. Uh, Steve Blake sucks, by the way. I was watching that game last night, and we, we, we gave out Detroit-San Antonio over. It was, on, it was on pace. It's 52-51 at the half. The game died. The war, the uh, the Pistons couldn't do anything in the third quarter. And then it was like, yeah, let's get the hell out of here. They're, they're, they're not even pushing the ball. They're down double digits. And Blake is running 15 seconds off the shot clock, and he's giving it, dumping it down low as guys are posting up. Where's the sense of urgency? That was horrific. Well, the beauty of it, Paul, the beauty of, you know, with, with the beauty of what we do is that every day we start 0-0. and zero. You know, as, as long as you'll have something left in your bankroll, if you didn't burn your bankroll to death with yesterday's loss, and I hope nobody out there did. And again, we were debating side total. It didn't matter if we had Detroit or the over. They were both wrong. And the Pistons, uh, I mean, it was not a good second half. Uh, you know, they came out, I mean, right from the get-go. Oh, you could uh, see San Antonio it. came out in the second half. And uh, the first was six, and it was eight, and it was 15. You know, Detroit, did, after playing very well uh, over the last four games, didn't have it last night. But... That was last night, my friend. Let's talk about tonight. Let's talk. You want to go to the Pac-12? Yes. You want to do it? You want me to do it? You You want to take it? You take it. I'll take it. Hey, right. I'm take, Hey, by the way, I'm taking a lot of abuse for the uh, over. <laughs> a lot of people ripping me for that. It's like, hey, I gave it a shot. It's my first time. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, I I perfected it over the years. You Paul. have, you have. Uh, you know, and I, I don't even know where I got that from. I think one time I said it, and someone said over, and I'm like, hey, that sounds cool. Let's try it. But for Thursday night, for tonight, let's take a look at the Arizona Wildcats minus the six at home against Cal. And I talked about how much I like this Cal team. But from a spot perspective, this one stands out like a sore thumb. Cal is as fat and happy as it gets. They've won seven straight. They've won every game this month. This is the toughest road game that they'll face during this span. And Arizona, feisty. Feisty would be what I expect out of Sean Miller's squad here after a pretty bad weekend up in the, uh, Utah and Colorado last week. So uh, throw in the revenge motif for that 74-73 loss earlier in the season. And yeah, let's lay it. I don't often step in front of streaking teams, but this is a spot to do it, Paul. Let's lay the six with Arizona. And this is one, again, and we're recording this early in the day. I would expect this line to go up. I bet it's sooner rather than later. Arizona minus six. It's a play of the day. And also, Cal is in the tournament, so we'll have to sweat that out because they've been so strong in February. That's another thing why uh, we like to play as well. We're back Friday. The small conference tournaments continue. A huge weekend, NBA and college. We'll run it all down on Sportsbit. Betting Insight today. 